Hi everyone and thanks for joining me. Today we're going to do a bit of a question and answer session. Um, I asked a couple of days ago about questions that you guys might like to ask me and about falconry and so today I'm hoping to cover some of those questions. There's going to be a further two videos if not three um, just to basically get through all these questions and I've split them up by topic so today we're going to talk about falconry generally um, and then in the next couple of videos we're going to look at what it is like working with the birds and also with hunting with the birds so I hope that this way I'll be able to cover lots of different questions over the next few days but I won't bore you to death in one long video so hopefully all the questions over these next couple of videos will make sense and it will all flow through really nicely. So I appreciate when I started this channel at no point have I ever actually introduced myself, um, who I am, what I do, I've just sort of thrown videos of birds out there and more recently um, obviously got quite a lot of response which isn't really something I expected. So um, you have to forgive me that I'd never really planned to introduce myself so much. I just was initially aiming to build my channel as a resource for falconers to teach them about falconry techniques, especially for newcomers to falconry. And now it's become a much bigger platform with people from all walks of life, which is amazing, um, who have got an, and now have grown an interest in falconry or have questions about it. And so I really want to be able to use this channel now to teach you guys, you know, we're all stuck in, we can't go out at the minute. Um, with the state of the world, it's pretty rubbish so hopefully I can bring a bit of my life into your guys worlds and just make your days a bit more interesting so thank you for all the questions um, and let's crack on my name's Amy uh, I'm 30 and I have a partner called James and we've lived together for a few years however um, unfortunately he moved to his new job further up north uh, in England with Covid jumping in um, you know basically four days after he moved um, it's made things a little bit more drawn out. Uh, our plan was never to move up at the same time because I've got quite a lot of animals in tow so we were going to do a sort of a, a steady move if you like over a few months and I'm really looking forward to introducing you um, to the new area. I'm really looking forward to sharing that with you. I have three dogs, so I have Luna, my German short haired pointer, and she's my main falconry dog, so she actually works with my birds, and I will go more into detail in the next couple of videos about that, um, but she basically works the flush and point game for my hawks to then hunt. Um, I have Scout, my Tekel, uh, Tekel is basically a working sausage dog and they're wire haired and he's absolutely fantastic um, and he's got an amazing nose on him and we actually have two tackles we have scout and rascal and they basically act as deer tracking dogs um, so that's what they're really obsessed with doing and then i've got finley my old german shepherd who's 10 now he's got a few years in him yet but um, he likes a lazier pace of life um, and then my partner has a further um, six dogs um, and we've got two more puppies on the way this year so so, you know, our life with dogs is really busy anyway. On top of our dogs, I've also got five ferrets and a load of chickens as well. So um, it's very, very busy. But, you know, if you're an animal person, and I'm sure a lot of you are, you appreciate that often you end up with all sorts of animals in your lives. So we both work outside in the countryside it's amazing you know um, our office is the woods or the fields that we're in um, and for both of us you know we couldn't think of anything better I don't think we'd ever want to live in the middle of a town I know I would feel totally at sea so um, you know I spend my days really avoiding people if I'm honest um, and just getting on with my day working with my birds doing whatever jobs are for that day um, I spend most of my day cleaning out animals to be honest um, before I get to do any of the fun stuff but yeah we we spend our time really as rurally as possible and for us it's an absolute haven so the first question is how old were you when you started getting into falconry is it just something you grew up with an interest in childhood that sparked or did it just come to you I didn't grow up in a family of falconers. Um, some falconers are very lucky that they pass their their falconry skills on to their children and so on. Um, but my parents weren't falconers. Um, in fact, my mum initially in my life um, 
it took her long enough just to tolerate me bringing animals home and you know generally wanting pets around um i think it was had a constant battle to begin with um i say that has since changed quite dramatically but you know i had like the normal pets guinea pigs rats um rabbits things like that but um yeah we we didn't really um we didn't do anything with any kind of exotic animals um for me i always had a massive interest in it but it wasn't something that my parents brought me into um falconry for me i guess became sort of a thing um in my early teens or just before when we go out visiting bird of prey centers just like lots of you guys do um certainly in england we have a quite a variety of places you can go if you want to go and meet birds of prey up close and that's been around for a long time and so you know we always had trips out as a family and when we went to a bird of prey center you know i was totally obsessed and it's something that has absolutely drawn me in and i know that in my early teens i started saying you know i want a hawk i'm going to fly my own bird um, and i would start asking for falconry experience days and i went on a couple of courses and it all sort of built from there really um but that's where my sort of initial burning desire came from. I think my parents obviously initially thought, you know, is this just going to be like a strange teenage fad that she's having? Um, you know, that I, I just sort of, I would grow out of it. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't the case, you know, and, and or fortunately, if you look at it um, long term, yeah, um, I absolutely did want a bird. And, and so I, I worked to, to sort of get to that end point. So for us over here that meant um, doing some courses um, and finding a mentor to, to look after me um, but you know we used to go bird watching when I was a child um, and it, I you know when I was a kid that was sort of good fun but it didn't it didn't really spark an initial fire and um, it was visiting birds of prey themselves which definitely drew me in and obviously as i hit my teens bird watching isn't exactly the coolest pastime as a teenager um <laughs> the social pressure so i i did really sort of um i sort of moved away from that but at that same time that's when birds of prey came into play so quite quickly it sort of turned on its head and funnily enough i have since come to love all birds obviously because the more you learn about birds of prey the more you want to learn about the, the other animals and birds that they hunt and so your knowledge just expands out from there are you a dog or cat person well to be honest i'm an animal person i wouldn't say that i particularly like one more than other although dogs massively feature in my life so i probably am more of a dog person now however i did have a cat um she lives with my parents now um but she was a stray that just decided one day that basically she was going to live um at our house and um she used to hang out with my birds she used to sit by their perches she used to come and watch me fly them in the field behind the house um to be honest she was probably more like a dog in her mind uh, than a cat anyway um, that might have been why I liked her so much but um, she always had this weird mutual understanding that she could sort of hang out with the birds which I always found quite fascinating um, they'd never really go sort of show interest in her and she would equally sort of ignore them but they would coexist very closely together um, so it was quite fascinating but now I guess I'm more of a dog person do you have a love for all animals yes I do um, you know it's it's easy isn't it to sort of say well obviously she loves birds um but you know but i'm fascinated by nature and by animals you know they've taken such a huge part of my life um i honestly prefer animals to people a lot of the time i find them much more black and white um but i think it's interesting especially when you look at it from a hunting point of view um it can be quite easy to sort of turn around and say um well if this person hunts with her birds how can she love other wildlife and it's not that simple and i will go into that uh, later on when i talk about hunting with birds um but yeah absolutely i'm obsessed what do you do in your free time um <laughs> free time doesn't really exist massively um you know even fitting in things like filming this video is it's a challenge and i have to really think about um when i'm going to do these things i'd love to be able to sit here and, and churn out videos every day but that's just not going to happen um you know if there's daylight hours i'm working usually um so you know in the summer my days go from in the winter maybe in the winter being eight hours long to easily 12 hours 16 hours sometimes more especially when breeding kicks in the breeding season and um, because i often have eggs and chicks and all sorts of things to deal with so my days just get longer and longer however if i do get a bit of free time um i love going out and visiting historical places um which 
obviously here in the UK we have masses of history um, so I'm a big history fan so you know an old castle ruins that kind of thing I'm there um, I think I was essentially born to live in another era I mean I'm a falconer so you know my job description isn't really um, the most up-to-date thing in the world um, so yeah I, I spend my life um, I'm, aside from falconry I'm, I'm massively interested in history so i'm a bit of a nerd really um i do like a bit of gaming as well so <laughs> a bit of a mix of things who helps you to video the different episodes um, i'm afraid that it's just me so if my video editing is not up to scratch or i'm filming in a bit of a crazy way just remember i'm a falconer first not a video producer um so please bear with me on that one but yeah it's just me and a camera and a stand which i seem to constantly have to move around or my little gopro um, and that's it that's that's all that's involved how did you learn to become a falconer so the process in the uk um is a bit different from some other areas. Some areas of the world you go through a licensing system um, and in some countries where hunting plays a large part they will do a general hunting license before then almost specialising in falconry. However in the UK our system is very simple. Um, anyone can become a falconer. Uh, there is no licensing system. The licensing is actually attached to the birds themselves not the people. So for us it allows us a great sense of freedom because we're able to access a wide range of birds to fly um, and there's no barrier to stop you to want to become a falconer however there's no legislation to sort of slow people down um, and although most people do the right thing and they take time to meet other falconers and to learn and to do courses or have tuition of some kind um, you know there are falconers who who basically are people that just go and buy a bird and think that they can learn because they've got the bird and any good falconer will tell you that is not the way to go um, if you think that you want to rush out and get a bird falconry is not for you it's something that takes a little while so um, the process for me to become a falconer is that in my teens I started you know shouting about how I wanted a hawk and, and putting the pressure on so I started getting books out of the library and I just read my way through four or five big falconry books trying to get my head around the language and and what it was about and what I was trying to achieve and then I just spent months practicing my falconer's knot and looking at all equipment and starting to acquire things I needed um, at the same time I was then starting to look for courses so I did two courses over a couple of years that were a week long and that was one-to-one -one tuition um, I did some other experience days and things in between as well um, and it's, you looked for a bit of volunteering work and sort of build it all up um, so I did that and I got to a point where I thought I was ready to have a bird um, when I look back now I think god I, I still wasn't ready uh, really um, but that is the joy of hindsight but I started to acquire my equipment I started to plan my muse and I decided what bird I was going to get which was a female Harris Hawk and so I basically um, I placed my order for that bird and then um, I then spent the next 10 months before that bird was due to be picked up basically preparing everything else so I built a shed where I'd have my freezers and my food prep area and I had my aviary which I had built um, I was getting in all the equipment you know this was built up over time um, but I got everything in place and then basically excitedly waited just looking at the calendar thinking oh my gosh you know this this bird's coming soon so the process of me becoming a falconer in the loosest terms was basically getting everything ready ordering my bird um, and then moving on from there however i don't think when i look back i really considered myself a falconer for a fair few years um, from when i actually started flying birds because although yes you can acquire a bird and you can start flying it um, to actually get to the bird to the point of hunting and to get to a point of competency um, takes a bit of time so to me being a falconer isn't just having a bird it's about what you do with it and what you achieve with it so it was something that took time um, but you know we're very lucky here to have so much freedom really um, 
a lot of countries you know go through the licensing system and, and it can take years and years um, technically it's no different here because when you learn as you gain practical experience you know you, you find a mentor or you go on courses that all takes time and if you're prepared to not rush um, then you will learn a lot more and you will do a lot better once you do get your first bird um, but that was really the process for me where do you get your birds from? So we get all our birds from private breeders. Um, every bird that we fly in the UK is captive bred. Um, we don't fly wild birds for falconry here. We don't take birds out of the wild. Our, our birds, you know, for generations have been captive bred. Um, that doesn't make them any less wild in, in their sort of temperament, um, but they are birds that have never known the wild and they, they don't know the associated dangers of predation and weather and territory that would be taught to them by their parents. So, you know, they are a very different creature in some respects. Um, but the the whole breeding system is fueled by falconers who breed from their own birds. You know, if you have a bird that you enjoy flying, that hunts well, a bit like any animal that proves itself to be a really great um, animal of it of its species that you think, wow, I'd want to fly something out of this, you know, um, then, you know, you would look to breed from that bird. And there are some people that are interested in breeding and, and breeding is separate to falconry. So I'm not going to go into it in a great detail, but um, often falconers find that after a few years, you know you want to start breeding from your birds because to fly a homebred bird is something very special um, you know you're flying a continuous line um, of birds that have had success hopefully and so it, it's something that a lot of falconers end up striving for but like I say it's all private breeders so if you want to order a bird you'd have to find either through word of mouth from other falconers people that breed that specific species you want um, or there's certain directories we can look in as well where some people will advertise um, so there's different ways of finding them but you would have to go out and convince that breeder that you're responsible enough that you're um, experienced enough to go out and fly that bird um, any reputable breeder is not just going to go here you go they want to see proof of your equipment of your telemetry which is your tracking uh, device basically that we use when we're free flying birds to make sure that uh, we know where they're going to be if they do go off on an adventure um, and you know of all the aviary and everything else so they want to see your setup um, so there's still a sort of a process of elimination um, when people are selling birds what species was your first bird and do you still have them? So my first bird was a female Harris Hawk. Um, to go on from our story um, earlier about sort of how I how I became a falconer, um, basically when I'd placed my order, those sort of last couple of weeks before she was due, I rung the breeder and I, and I said, you know, how's it going? But I wasn't getting any response. I had one brief conversation, which was a bit vague and um, I sort of didn't feel like he'd answered my questions well. And then when I rang him for the next couple of weeks, I just got no response at all, um, which was pretty gutting. You know, I imagine that I've been obsessing over this for, you know, for years and, you know, I've spent the last year preparing to get this bird. Um, and now the reality is dawning on me that, well, am I going to be able to find another bird? Because people have ordered their birds months in advance. You know, a bird of prey is only having four or five chicks top. So it's not like there's an endless supply of these birds across the country. Um, they're either available or they're not. And now the breeder that I've chosen to trust had, had basically disappeared off the face of the earth. Um, so I tried a couple more times, I left some more messages and got nothing back. Um, so I started looking through the directory and I was just ringing different breeders to see if anyone had any availability. Um, I rang a friend, well, I rang um, a chap um, who was advertising birds and, and he didn't have any. However, he knew someone who did and he put me in touch. Uh, and to cut a long story short, um, I traveled up north to go and get my bird. Um, and I was really, really grateful to that guy. Um, he actually became my mentor um, once I had her. A couple of weeks after I, I got her home, he rang me to see how I was getting on. Um, and I chatted to him and he started to, to contact me regularly and we, we started to, over the phone, because um, he, he lived about two and a half hours from me, um, sort of uh, go through things and he would check my progress and, and give me advice where I needed it. Um, which to be honest, I did need quite a lot of help. You know, the idea when you read something in a book, you think, yeah, that makes sense. When you try and put that into practice with a bird that has decided that they don't want to follow any of the things you've read about, 
that becomes more of a challenge. Um, so eventually I went up to his place and I took my bird with me and I started to fly her with him and he would have me around for the day and you know we, we would learn about um, sort of different aspects uh, practically. Um, really I could have done with a mentor before I started however you have to bear in mind I was a, a shy um, teenager and um, it was a very new world for me and at the time not so open. We didn't have all that big sort of like Facebook community and online community that, that exists now for everything that, that people do. So um, it was that little bit harder. Um, I had joined a falconry club um, but again I was really probably too shy um, to, to ask um, or to go to any meetings because I just felt totally out of my depth um, and, and that's just how I was. So um, so he was a, a real lifesaver um, and we started to go hawking together. So as my training rolled on and I got my bird free flying, the autumn rolled in um, and that's the start of our hunting season in sort of September, October, depending on what species you're gonna hunt. Um, so we go rabbit hawking together um, and, and it really formed a bond and he's actually turned into one of my oldest sort of folk and friends so um, you know it, it's really quite nice that he was always sort of supportive at the beginning and it, and it got me really to where I am. Uh, my hawk was called Layla um, I don't have her anymore sadly um, she died a few years after um, I got her um, she had a couple of injuries that she sustained that in the end um, it was that horrible decision of the having to make um, to, to basically have to start again and, and say goodbye to her um, you know when I look back now with years more experience it's easy to think you know I would have done things differently but um, you know that was my first bird and you know I, I've feel frustrated that I, I couldn't still have her now because she could still be with me now they can live a very long time um, but you know that that's how things turned out so no she's not with me sadly um, however luckily whilst I had her um, I took on a second hawk um, and he was called Jack and the great thing was that when she passed um, I actually I still had him to fly I think if I hadn't have had a second bird for me that would have been it. I would have stopped it. I would have thought falconry is not for me. It's too emotional. I've been too involved. It, it's just, it's such a, a, an intense um, experience that I probably would have just turned around and backed away from it. Whereas actually because I had a second hawk, you know, he kept me going. Um, and so having that second bird made a massive difference um, and has kept me doing falconry for now, you know, around 15 years. Uh, nearly so <laughs> it's uh, you know it's become an absolute obsession in my life where do you keep your birds so my birds have always stayed with me um, so I live on a farm now so there's plenty of room for them um, I wouldn't even consider living away from my birds that's a non-starter so um, yeah they've always been a big part of my life and they all will always stay with me I would never commute to go and see them is falconry your main job if so, how do you get paid? If not, how do you find time to do falconry? So yeah, falconry is my job. Um, I made it my job. It wasn't initially. Um, falconry as a job is a hard one to get your head around. Um, so initially I was actually a web designer. That was my proper job in the real world one day. Um, and my, my web designing work was sort of flexi time. So I was able to go out and fly my hawk and work around that, um, which was fantastic. So I, I made my, my work work for falconry um, and that was great but in the end I decided that I had enough of staring in front of a computer. Um, I didn't go to university after school I went straight into work so um, you know I was I was working and flying birds and probably having a great old time but I decided that you know I really wanted to do birds full time so I decided to make the move to go commercial if you like um, and because of my love of history um, I initially worked on doing displays um, from a historical angle so um, so you know falconry itself goes back thousands of years um, and being in England you know we have a huge array of historical sites um, so every weekend you know I would go and do flying demonstrations um, at different historical sites and that was a big part of my life for, for a few years um, but it was very very intense work um, so I started off in a in what we call a display environment it's not a falconry um, don't get me wrong bird of prey 
um, display flying is, is not falconry, it's a way to introduce you guys to birds of prey up close um, and I think it's fantastic. Um, but it, it allowed me to practice falconry, it allowed me to be with birds of prey all day every day and so I absolutely loved it. Um, I then sort of ran, I said moved away from the historical side but still run experience days um, and over here it's become quite popular, people like to come out and spend a day with the birds as I'm sure many of you guys would when you see the footage of them. Um, so basically people come along for experiences and they spend a few hours with the birds and that's sort of how I made my way. Um, I then worked in the display, continued working in that sort of display environment um, and also sort of worked in a centre environment as well so where people would come and visit a huge range of birds um, and again see them free flying and be educated about them. However my love of falconry, of hunting, um, has always underpinned what I've done and I wanted more and more time to do that so more recently in the last few years um, I changed track slightly and I set up a falconry centre um, on a on a private estate um, and I had access to thousands of acres um, to fly and hunt uh, with my birds um, and so I brought people in to have experiences with the birds flying them to a gloved fist um, and to sort of get up close but also to take people hunting with birds um, and for me that's massively fulfilling because the way I see it is that when you go out hunting with a bird of prey you're being allowed into a secret world you know these guys really um you know in the wild if you're trying to watch wild birds of prey hunt you're very lucky to see what are real fleeting seconds of of, of reactions you know uh, watching a peregrine in the wild stoop and catch a pigeon or a duck it's just something you don't get to see that much because you probably haven't even noticed that the peregrines above you um, my falcons will see a peregrine up in the sky and sound off and i can look up and spot it and watch it which is amazing but when we go out hunting with these birds you know you get a first hand glimpse um that's way more exciting than a documentary you know that's sort of watching from a distance but you're involved in that moment and you get to see the way nature sort of takes place right in front of your eyes and it's so intense and amazing that um you know, i really wanted to share that with other people so uh, my birds are very tolerant of, of going up with strangers with myself um, and we go out in a small group um, and they would get to experience seeing the falcons and the hawks hunting so that's sort of how i've made my living if you like um to be honest falconry isn't a job anyway you know it's a it is a lifestyle and it sounds a bit cliche um but you know having people in to, to come and experience is great because we can educate and share what's going on but it also allows me to work with those birds and to learn from those birds and um, you know i can't put my work away at four o'clock five o'clock in the evening when i think my day is done if the birds need something doing or we've still got daylight and there's birds that need flying and exercising then that takes priority it's obvious you were close to the animals before getting into falconry, but how has falconry changed you? Do you find yourself influenced by their regal assertiveness and poise? So I think falconry has changed me in quite a big way and the birds themselves have slowed me down. That's probably how they've changed me. Um, I've become a much more patient person and I've, be you know, by having to work with them, you know, they demand that you work at a certain pace. So you can't rush things, you can't demand things, you can't make them do things any quicker than they're prepared to. So it changes your whole perspective about how you work around them and how you work with others, and that includes people, um, and sort of how you see the world. You know, I, I think I see the world from their point of view a lot of the time. When I'm walking out in the countryside, I'm not just bimbling along making loads of noise, I'll hear a little crack of some leaves and I'll think, oh, what bird's down there? Or what animal's over there? Or look, there's a hare running through the field. Um, and I, it's, falconry is, and the birds themselves really have allowed me to be more aware of what's going on in nature around me. And it's given me more of an appreciation. So yeah, I, I think they've given me more patience um, and more appreciation. I'm curious to know how and when falconry was originally developed and what practical uses it used to have. So we don't know the exact beginnings of falconry um, and there's lots of books and articles about it so it's not something I'll massively go into detail about, it's something you guys can explore. I'll pop some links down below as well for you to have a look at. Um, but we know it went back around 3000 years. Um, it, it's incredible with its history, not only in terms of um, 
sort of how far back it goes but how widespread across the world you'll find falconry in history across most parts of the world and it's something that brings people together um, falconry itself was really designed as a way to bring food to the table uh, initially it was about survival um, so you know you would go out hunting with your hawk to bring something back uh, to feed your family and the birds that were used were quite specific in terms of their ability to do that as a falconer are you able to work with any bird you choose or does there need to be a connection between bird and handler to make it work if so what happens when a falconer and bird do not click well so yes technically you know you could work with any bird within reason um you know if you've got the skills to be able to safely handle and fly and train those birds then yeah absolutely that should work however yeah there does need to be a bit of a bond and a bit of a click you know um for instance i know how to safely pick up a hawk but if i was to walk over to my friend's hawk uh, and pick her up you know the hawk might turn around and look at me and go you know you're not my falconer why are you handling me and um, just because a bird is used to working with one person doesn't mean they're necessarily going to want to work with everyone and again that depends on the bird you know they're very individual just like people they've got their own personalities um but it's sort of yes you can work with any bird um but you also have to sort of work with them you know that you can't just force them to do something it has to be as much on their terms it's a it's a team effort really so yes you know if if they are the right kind of bird to be trained or to be worked with then yes you should have that opportunity um however yes sometimes things don't click and there may be reasons for that um commonly it can be where birds have been incorrectly trained and handled in their early years because birds of prey only have a short window for learning um you know you can't teach an old bird new tricks um so when that bird is young and um, when they've just fledged um, into that first year that's really your critical period for learning that's when you want them to learn everything so if you're working with an older bird that's maybe been mishandled it's been not well looked after then yeah that can make things hard but if we're working with fresh untrained birds that um that are are to become falconers birds then you know that, that you should have that chance to work with them how you build that bond and how strong that bond is is down to you as the falconer though so if you don't put the work in you won't get anything back they give as much as they get basically what is the easiest type of bird to work with and what type is usually more challenging or difficult to train so this is a question i get asked a lot what's the easiest bird what's the best beginner's bird to start with um, I'm going to sort of flip it on its head and say, you know, there is no easy bird. There is no beginner's bird. There are birds that are, are better to start with. Um, so there are extremes that you would avoid. However, you know, you have to bear in mind that you're working with highly intelligent um, predators that, you know, can make up their own mind about what they would like to do. And there is no easy cuddly one. You know, you can mess up a barn owl as much as a Harris hawk, as much as a golden eagle they all have their needs and requirements and if you can't meet those things you know you will struggle so the important and the crucial bit of being a falconer is that you take the time to learn yourself to gain the skills practically and sort of theoretically um, to make sure that you actually understand what you're going to be doing before you then acquire a bird the extremes that sort of people would avoid which is sort of how we end up with our beginners birds is that the bigger the bird you go the more you're going to be dealing with types of aggression because you're dealing with a, a, a predator that is just physically very very powerful um, and then the smaller you go the tiny little micro falcons like kestrels and merlins and hobbies are incredibly delicate they weigh barely anything you're talking 150 200 grams some of these birds so where things go wrong with a little bird is that, that things can happen very quickly and because they often have a very high metabolism these birds need a lot of food even though they're small and this is where people can get it wrong so they buy a small bird because they think oh it's not aggressive it's tiny i can manage it however its whole system is more delicate its feathers are more delicate its legs are more delicate and then when you come to feeding it if you don't give it enough food its weight's going to crash down because it's not being provided with enough meal in a day and because it's got that high metabolism it burns that food off very quickly and so it's very easy to get into trouble with a small bird because it's a very tiny window between doing things right and doing things wrong 
on a bigger bird, say overnight we had a really cold night, if I was to um, give half a meal that the bird needed to a large bird, he's going to lose a little bit of weight, he's going to be maybe a little bit more hungry the next day, a bit keener, but you won't see a lot of difference. Whereas in a tiny bird, that can be the difference between I'm hungry and I'm starving. We generally advise against people starting with very small birds because their whole, their whole husbandry is very important and they're very, very delicate. And we avoid the larger birds of prey, um, like the eagles, for example, because you're dealing with so much bird, there is serious potential for things to go wrong. You know, you're playing with a predator as much as you'd be playing with a lion. Um, you know, these are not to be underestimated just because they're made of feathers and they look fluffy. Um, their feet are incredibly powerful and the bigger the bird the more power there is so um, that's where you then end up with what we call the beginner's birds because we have this lovely middle ground with birds like the red tail and the harris hawk that are a medium sort of size they're not too big they're not too small um, they're quite powerful they're, they're good they're well built for hunting um, but they're not on any kind of extreme um, but what i would more importantly say is there's a very different way to going about things so we ask people to look at the land that they've got available to them and if they're going to hunt with that bird what quarry what prey have they got um, to hunt so there's no point saying i want to fly a falcon if you just got woods that's all you can fly in is woods and forests because the falcon can't fly in that kind of environment um, and then you're like well so i've only got rabbits well actually a hawk's probably going to be much more suited to your needs if you've got big open fields and pheasants everywhere you've potentially got the kind of land that you can fly falcons. So we actually say to look at the land, look at the quarry, look at the um, the mentor that you have and how they might be able to help you. And it's important to find a mentor that is going to guide you on the kind of bird you're interested on. So there's no point buying a beginner's bird because actually you want to get the bird that you want to work with. These guys live 20, 30 plus years. Um, so there's no point buying a bird that you want to fly for a couple of years to learn, to then just pass on and hope it has a good life. Um, when actually, if you spent an extra year or two working with a falconer, learning those techniques and finding a mentor who can help you through that whole process, then you can fly the bird you want to fly. Um, but most people sadly aren't prepared to spend that time doing that extra homework, spending that extra time getting to know and understand the species because the idea of something can be very different from the reality. Um, I always wanted to fly goshawks um, but I didn't start with a goshawk and I remember the day that I did get my first goshawk. I have four now. I have two females and two males. Um, my older uh, male and female are, are 13 and 14. Uh, my younger ones are, are five and six. Um, but th the first day I brought home my first goshawk which was this huge female um, you know they're just incredibly powerful birds um, and I just thought wow I've just spent a few years flying Harris Hawks here this creature is totally different um, and it was a real big eye-opener um, and it was quite a change of pace so just because you've flown one bird doesn't mean you should then leap onto something totally different what you should do is just spend your time working to understand the species you want to work with because they're so individual and then building up to a point where you can then take that bird on. I'm interested in hearing your perspective on falconry as performance. So this is where the line gets blurry um, and it's quite interesting but um, as I've said a couple of times, so forgive me repeating myself, falconry is the art of hunting with a bird of prey. However, for you guys, falconry is seeing people fly birds of prey in close proximity to the public so that you guys can obviously enjoy these animals. Um, for me, performance um, if it's for educational value I think is really important because we're so detached from the world around us from the nature around us we're wrapped up in our own little worlds in our little concrete houses you know um, we forget about the, the wider things going on and, and it's important to introduce some of these amazing species of, of birds and other animals that exist that that people haven't heard of um, you know there's there's some amazing work being done with with large eagles um, and vulture species that people probably have never thought about um, and unless you show people these birds and get them really sort of 
amazed and interested um, how can you expect people to care for those birds so from an educational point of view if somebody is bringing birds to people to fly them from the point of view of lighting their life up about birds of prey about falconry about the conservation of their wild counterparts yeah i think it's a great thing and um you know i can't take large groups of people hunting with birds because it just wouldn't be practical but i can take a group of people introduce them to a barn owl and fly it with them and tell more about how barn owls work and how we can support those animals um, and and that does a very good service to those wild birds of prey um, because we're able to educate and so yeah I, I think it has its place if it's a case of a guy walking around with a bird on his arm saying look how cool I am this is my bird um, and it, it becomes a, a, a battle of egos that's not something I'm interested you know if you're working with birds of prey you know it's an honor um, and we should respect the birds we work with so um, for me you know educational flying is fantastic and it's really important for conservation uh, for education but yeah if it's about egos I'm not really interested if I'm honest do you or falconers work with wild preservation um, or science and if so how so yeah this is something that's really important to me um falconry is vital for the work that we do with wild birds of prey and i think falconry plays a really critical role in the conservation element and understanding birds of prey there's no better way to understand an animal than to work with it um, because you learn about their behavior you learn about the way they fly the choices that they make um, or the, the bad choices that they make um, and you're able to find a way to manage those birds and to look after them so firstly for rehabbed wild birds that works really well if you have a falconer involved with an injured wild bird we're able to care for them in a safe way that doesn't damage their feathers, that allows them to build fitness, that gives them a good diet. Um, you know, we will hopefully give them a much better chance than someone that hasn't had that sort of falconry set of skills. You know, you can take an injured bird of prey to a vet and you can get a physical ailment treated. You know, if they've got some kind of illness or disease that can be treated, you can get them back to normal health. However, the problem you have with wild birds is that you may spend three, four, five weeks treating these birds, but then when they're ready to go back into the wild, they've lost all their fitness. You know, think of them as an athlete. So as a falconer, we can use our falconry skills to not only initially help support um, their actual sort of physical health, um, you know, take them to the vet and then look after them while they recover, we can then go on to build fitness and to build stamina back and to release them in a way that gives them a chance because often actually wild release can actually have a very low su su sort of success rate um but with the help of a falconer say for instance if i was a peregrine in um you know i could fly it like a falconry bird to exercise it to a lure which is a thing that we swing around for the bird to chase and catch and i can build that fitness up fatten that bird back up when it's ready to go and release a wild bird that is actually fit and has a good stamina and is full of food um, that will actually then have a fighting chance rather than a bird that's just been mended and then released back into the wild but that isn't actually fit enough to survive. Yeah, falconers play a massive part in conservation and I think without them our wild birds would massively struggle um you know i i do get the odd birds in mostly barn owls and tawny owls more than anything um i've had the occasional buzzard um but for us here in england it's owls that suffer the most they fly into cars or get hit by cars and um, because they hunt low over the roads um and then they also struggle in the winter so sort of january february time here is sort of our deepest part of our winter where food is scarce and they go from having plentiful food through the summer they're doing quite well in the autumn and the early part of the winter but when the later part of the winter hits that's really survival of the fittest and for a lot of birds you know that, that is game over and um, so people can literally pick them up off the floor because they're so hungry um, they've just run out of energy reserves uh, it, it's important to remember birds of prey don't fly for fun they fly for survival and we often come across emotions where people will tell me i think they should be flying free in the wild um but they don't actually understand those birds or, or how they work in the wild 
And birds of prey spend most of their day in the wild sat still. They save their energy for the hunt, just like something like a cheetah. Um, you know, you don't see cheetahs and lions running for miles across the, the desert plains. You see them sitting, conserving energy, and choosing that moment to hunt. And that's what our birds of prey do. Um, you know, as a predator, if they can't catch their food, they haven't got any energy and they won't survive. And that's black and white, that's life. Um, the only variation is that when they're in the summer and they've got chicks, they're then having to hunt four times as much because they're then actually having to bring food to the nest all through the day to keep their chicks fed. But they are saving their energy for food and food alone. Um, so there isn't that same sort of element of fun that we imagine that if we could fly, we would just fly around because it seems like a good idea. So. Um, from a rehab point of view I think falconry is really important and from a conservation point of view because yeah um, falconers are heavily wrapped up in conservation um, if you go on to the International Association of Falconry's website uh, I'll pop a link down here um, you can have a look at some of the projects that are going on um, particularly there's a project trying to save saker falcons at the moment um, and there are also several projects dealing with vulture species um, without going on too much of a tangent some of our vultures are critically endangered and they are basically nature's recyclers without these birds um, disease spreads because vultures clear up the dead carcasses that are lying around um, but they're suffering issues from electrocution and from poisoning um, and from predation and, and problems from persecution from people um, and if we lose them we are going to have a severely damaged planet um, if it wasn't damaged already enough um, and falconers can use their skills uh, to actively get involved you know we are incredibly passionate about what we do um, so we can utilize what we learn from so intensely working with a bird of prey and we can help support those wild birds because that's what we want to see we want to see birds of prey flying around in the wild i hope you've enjoyed this first part of the question and answers um, there's going to be two more parts this yet i'm going to talk in the next episode about uh, the birds that I work with and the sort of what I deal with day to day and in the third episode I'm going to talk about hunting with birds of prey so I've split it down because I mean this has already been pretty epic um, but I will upload the next video very soon and thank you for watching and I'll see you all very soon <laughs>